If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy, we'll look at chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, and we're going to use that as a jumping off point for the rest of the scriptures today. The scripture reads, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you except to fear the Lord your God by walking in all his ways, to love him and to worship the Lord with all your heart and all your soul? Keep the Lord's commands and statutes I am giving you today for your own good. Father, these are your words. You gave them to Moses. You have preserved them throughout all time. And they're true because you are the author. Lord, we ask that you teach us today. In your name we pray. Amen. This is a message that I had prepared for the beginning of the year. And since this is the first time we've met this year, this is where we're starting at. I want you to notice the focus of the scripture. See, the scripture says that God expects us to have something. And what he expects is for us to have a godly fear of him. Now we've got to understand from the outset that that word fear does not mean that we are afraid and that we cower from him. But what that word fear means is that we have an awe and a reverence for Him. And there's a big difference between the two. I fear when blue lights come behind my vehicle. But that is different than giving the respect that I gave my teachers in the classroom. And that is the difference in how the word fear is used here. The respect that is due our Lord and Savior. Well, that brings up the question, how do we fear Him appropriately? And God, through Moses, told us that there are three ways that we do this. We are to walk in His ways, we are to worship Him with our heart and our soul, and we are to keep His commandments. That sounds simple, doesn't it? It is, and it's not. It's not because of who we are. Because who are we on the inside? We are rebellious sinners. And in our deep, dark recesses, we cannot walk in His ways. We cannot worship Him. And we cannot keep His commandments because of who we are. But thanks be to God for the cross of Jesus Christ because with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then we can walk in His ways, we can worship Him, and we can keep His commandments. Yes, ma'am. Why, why does God give us the power Why does he give us the power to respect him? No, to, uh, to disrespect? He never intended for us to have that option. But because Adam and Eve sinned and they ate that forbidden fruit at the very beginning, we have the option whether to obey him or not. Wow. Did he give us that option? We're going to get into that. Because that is a very, very good point. Why? Why do we do that? Why do we have that? Because God wants to see what's in our hearts. And we're going to cover that. But that is a very good question. It's very insightful for what the intent of this is. Let me jump down a little ways. God does not want what we can do he wants our heart. 
And when we give Him our heart, then what we do changes. And we'll get into that. But that's a very good question, Leah. So how do we do this? We do it by keeping what I call are the three T's. And what are these three T's? Time, talent, and if you listen to Victor, you've heard the word treasures, but I also use the word tithes to go with that. Those are the three T's. Your time, your talent, your tithes, and your treasures. Well, what in the world does all those have to do? Well, Leah here has tied it all together, so we're going to look at it. Because all of it deals with our heart and what happens with our heart. Well, what about time? I want you to take a look at two scriptures in the New Testament. One is Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 20. It says this, As he, he was talking about Jesus, was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Now, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, when we flip over to Acts 1, verse 8, this is what Jesus told the disciples before he ascended into heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now what in the world do those two have to do about time? These two verses are separated by about three years. But I want you to notice what Jesus did not do with these disciples. Jesus did not give them power immediately. Did you ever notice that? Those disciples did not get the power of God when they at first became disciples. You ever thought, why? Because they couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle what was going to happen. See, they had to be prepared. And that process took them about three years of being with Jesus. And in that three years, what happened to them? See, they lived with Jesus. They walked with Him. They talked with Him. They watched Him. They listened to Him. They ate with him. They loved him. They wondered about what was going on. See, they wondered a lot about what Jesus was doing. How many times did they ask, Jesus, why did you do it this way? Jesus, what's going on here? And Jesus used each one of those times to do what? To teach and to prepare them for what was to come. And Jesus used that time to mold them into the men that they were going to become. They witnessed his miracles. They watched how he confronted sin and the religious leaders. And they wondered when all of this was going to pass. As they were with him, they were wondering what is going on. And in the end, they even misunderstood and misapplied some of his teachings. And Jesus used that to correct them. But why did he do all that? Because Jesus knew that when the time was right, he was going to leave them, and he was going to fill them with the Holy Spirit, and then they would be able to reflect back upon what Jesus taught and through the power of God properly teach it to others. Twelve uneducated fishermen turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ. But what does all that have to do with time? See, I want you to understand something. Those disciples and us had this in common. We all have the same amount of time available to us. It's how it's redeemed. But what do I mean by that? There are 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, 365 days in a year. 
Do you know what all that means? It means that each day we have over 1,400 minutes available to us. It means that in each week we have over 10,000 minutes available to us. In each month we have close to 44,000 minutes available to us. And every year we have 525,600 minutes in a year. Well, that sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But I want you to remember how fast last year went. And y'all know that this year is going to go even faster. How do we redeem the time that's given us? Well, Jesus showed us. You see, Jesus wants us to be in his word. Just as his disciples were with him, he has given us his word to be with us. He wants us to talk to him. We need to spend time in prayer to him, pouring out what's on our hearts, what's on our minds, what's on our souls, what's going on. We need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for the laws. We need to pray for the church. We need to pray. But you know, if we just do all the talking and don't do any listening, we miss out. Because he also wants us to listen to him. And sometimes listening to him means we've got to be quiet. And listen in the still of our heart. And just listen for that still, small voice. You know the one that spoke to Elisha at the mouth of the cave? But reading, talking, and listening, they all bear nothing unless we do it. See, that's what he wants us to do. How do we redeem our time? We redeem it by reading, talking, listening, and doing. The same way the disciples did. Well, what about talents? Matthew 25 has a very familiar section of Scripture. And I'm not going to read it all, but it's Matthew 25, 14 through 30. It's the parable of talents. Now, what's so special about that? The master goes away. To one servant he gives five talents. To another he gives three. To another he gives one. And what happens when he comes back? The one who had five did what? Gave him five plus five more. The one who had two did what? Gave him two plus two more. And the one that had one went and dug it up and gave it back to him. And what did the master say? You fully served it. You knew that I took and yet, you didn't even put it in the bank to get the interest. And he took what that one had and gave it to the one that had five. You know, there's a very powerful lesson in that for us. A very, very powerful lesson. See, I want you to know that God is teaching us with that parable that everybody has a talent. And I'm not talking about just money. I'm talking about something that God has given you that you can do. Everybody is born with a talent. See, a talent, it could be something that is being very well, very good with financial books. It could be something that is woodworking. It could be something that is as a poster. You, know, you fill it in. Everybody has got a talent that God has given them and God expects them to use. But to us believers, it goes farther. See, not only has He given us a talent to use, but the moment we are born again, He gives us a spiritual gift. Now, what in the world is the difference between a talent and and a spiritual gift. It is there's a big difference between the two. And I want you to understand this. A spiritual gift is something that gives every believer, when they are born again, to use for the kingdom. <coughs> to use 
for the body. So everybody's got a talent. All believers have a spiritual gift. Your talent and spiritual gift may be along the same lines. But it may be two totally different things. But what does God expect us to do? He expects us to use them. Amen. Use them for His glory. Use them so people can see who He is through what we do. He wants us to use our spiritual gifts to build up the local body. You see, every single one of us in this room today has a spiritual gift that is meant for this church to build this body up to reach others. God put us together for that. And there are some that say, well, I don't have a spiritual gift. Let me tell you, I, I got into an argument over the course of several months with a lady about this. She kept saying, I don't have spiritual gift. Yes, you do. And this went on and on. And finally I had heard enough and I finally told her, look, if you don't have a spiritual gift, maybe you don't know Jesus Christ. Because if you are a believer, you have got a spiritual gift that God has given you. And God expects you to use it for the edification of his church. So he's giving you time and he expects you to, to edify the time, to redeem it properly. He expects you to redeem your talents and your gifts properly. He also expects you to redeem your treasures and your tithes properly. One of the most famous scriptures about tithes is found in Malachi 3, 8 through 12. Will a man rob God and you are robbing me? You ask, how do we rob you? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions, you are suffering under a curse. Yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouses so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine and your field and will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate for you will be delightful in the land, says the Lord of hosts. See, this verse is very straightforward. What it's saying is if we do not give, then we are robbing both God and ourselves of the blessings that God wants to give us. Now I want you to understand this. I am not here saying you give money. No, I'm not doing that. What I am saying is that God has blessed you. And you need to be aware of how he's blessed you. And use that blessing to bless others. And one of the ways he blesses us is with income. You know, and that's a talent and a gift that God wants you to use. But I want you to know something. Y'all heard me refer to checks box Christians. I come, check. I've given, check. I'm good for a few weeks, check. No. God is not interested in checks box Christians. God is interested in what Lee was getting at earlier, our heart. You see, Jesus warned about this. Jesus warned about giving just to give. He said, he said in Matthew 23, verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier portions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness, but these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. God doesn't want your time, God doesn't want your talent, and God doesn't want your tithes. Unless he has your heart. Did you hear me? If he doesn't have your heart, do not give him your time, your talent, or your treasures. Because you're throwing it away. Our heart shows how we love him. We give out of an overflow of love for what He has done for us. 
If we give just to give, then we are no better than the Pharisees that Jesus condemned. God wants us to give from our heart because of what He has done in our heart. And what has He done in our heart? He has taken all the sin, the same shame, and the suffering. He bound it to Himself on Calvary. And when we come to Him, He does just what the psalm says. Cast it as far as the east is from the west. Christians, we give because He gave to us and we want to show our appreciation for what He has done for us. If you want to give to give, pay your taxes. God is not taxing us. He's wanting us to give out of a response of what He has done for us. He gave everything for us so that we could come to Him. And He wants us to give all that we have to come to Him so that we can be cleansed of who we are so that when we serve with our time, we serve with our talents, we serve with our spiritual gifts, and we serve with our treasures and our tithes, that it is done from the grateful and right heart. And then our Lord is magnified. Church, how are we going to worship Him this year? How are we going to redeem our time? How are we going to redeem our talents? How are we going to redeem our treasures? We redeem it by giving our heart over to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I say, here I am. Send me. Send me. And when we can rightfully say that, do you know what God says? Well done, my good and faithful servant. And he will use us like Paul to transform our world because our heart is set on heavenly things, not earthly things. That's how we need to worship him. It's all a heart matter. And that is something to think about. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you. Lord, that you are consistent from Genesis to Revelation. Lord, about our heart. Lord, you teach that our heart is deceitful. But you can fix it at the cross. And Father, I pray that as we look forward to this year, Lord, that we will look to the cross with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. And Lord, we will redeem our time, our talents, and our tithes to you because we worship a risen Savior. In your name we pray. Amen. Hello, this is Pastor David. Listen, you hear a lot of Christians talk about heaven and salvation, and, and you may be asking the question, what is that? Well, first off, you have to know this. Not everybody goes to heaven. The only people that go to heaven are those that know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that is the process called salvation. We come to know Jesus Christ, and we are saved by him through what he's done. To just want to give you a, a, an overview of, of how we can do that. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, all that means is that everybody, there is nobody living on the face of this earth that has not done something wrong against God. Yes, even Christians. 
We are forgiven because of what Jesus did. And we'll, we'll get into that. But everybody has done something against God because of who we are. Romans 6.32 goes on to tell us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you to think about that. We, we just learned that all have sinned. We've all done bad things against God. And we've fallen short of his glory and his, his perfect peace. And yet, there is a payment that has to take place for that. For the wages of sin, that's a payment. A payment must be paid. The wages of sin for every bad thing that we do must be payment. And what is that payment? God's word is very clear. It's death. It's death. Every time we do something bad that goes against God's glory, the punishment is death. It was that way from the beginning. And it's going to be all that way all until he comes and takes his children home. It would be sad if he stopped there, but he goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, God realized that there is no way that we could come to him ourselves. And he made a way for us through Jesus Christ. And that is God's gift to each one of us. And why is that? Well, see, Romans 5.28 teaches us that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. But God demonstrates. It means that God showed. God showed what he was going to do. You see, he told us what he was going to do all the way back at the beginning when Adam and Eve sinned, when they ate that fruit. And he said that there is coming, there is coming a salvation. And that salvation was in Jesus Christ, his one and only begotten son, who walked the face of this earth blameless. He was without sin, means he did not do anything that was against God. And yet he came to die, to make penalty, makes to take our penalty for him. That's his gift. That's how God demonstrates our love for us. Now, there's no way that we can come to him, but he provided a way for us to come to him. And that was through Jesus' death. For the wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ paid that penalty for us. Well, what do we do with that? Romans 10 Verse 9 tells us that if we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you see, we have to know it and we have to know it. Not only do we have to know intellectually, but we have to know it inside of us that God has done something special for us. And we have to proclaim it. We have to proclaim it to the world and to God what he did for us that he paid our sin debt for us and why did he do that what happens when that happens when we make that proclamation Romans 8 verse 1 tells us there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus the law of sin and death has been taken away from us because of what Jesus Christ did for us at the cross. It's pretty simple, but it's so hard. And my question to you is, would you like to follow this road to salvation? If you do, here's a simple prayer that you can pray to God right now. This prayer is a way for you to declare to God that you are relying on Jesus Christ for your salvation. I want you to understand that these words will not save you. Only faith in Jesus Christ will save you. If you would like to pray this prayer, please bow your heads and repeat after me. God, I know that I am a sinner and I have sinned against you. I am deserving of death because of my sins. But Jesus Christ himself took the punishment that I deserve so that through faith I can be forgiven. With your help, 
I place my trust in you for salvation. Thank you for your wonderful grace and forgiveness, the gift of eternal life because of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have prayed this prayer, and if you have made a decision for Jesus Christ, please let us know so that we can help you along for this new journey. If you need to ask some questions, please feel free to contact us. You can contact us through email, through our Facebook page, through regular mail, or by phone. May God richly bless you, and may God keep you along your life's journey. Have a wonderful day.